welcome everyone to our webinar. We're really excited to have you here today um, on our topic, health data security and why Australian organization should secure it. So again, thank you all for joining. As we all know, uh, protecting data in the healthcare industry is no easy feat and healthcare providers and their business associates must balance in protecting one, patient privacy, and two, also delivering quality patient care and meeting the strict requirements set forth by HIPAA and other regulations. We also know that these data breaches co can cost the healthcare industry millions of dollars. So it's important that we understand on why we should secure our data so that we don't fall into one of these breaches. My name is Davina Elango and I have a long history of healthcare industry with also 12 years of sales background. I recently um, work as a sales and marketing manager for ITSEC. And I'm equally passionate about healthcare and cybersecurity. So it gives me great sorry, <laughs> gives me great pleasure to be a moderator today. Um, so before I get into it, I'll just give um, a quick brief about today. Um, we'll be running for 60 minutes. It will include a chat moderator, um, a Q&A chat bar. So um, please feel free to um, put your um, questions in throughout the session and we will address it at the end and our um, speakers will um, answer those questions for you. I'd also like to add, we'll be following the Chatham House rule, which is to aim to guarantee anonymous to those speaking within this wall or within this webinar. So we encourage you to participate and um, we'll make sure your information and your identity is not revealed. So we're all here today because of this topic that is affecting many of our organizations. And I am honored to introduce to you our panel as well as our agenda. We'll be talking about health data and it constitutes health data triumphs all other personal data, which is the rise of the new oil and why securing it is so important. We will also be touching on the threat landscape, impact and risk for Australian companies, the one-on-one -on, -one on Australian and global health data security laws and regulations. We will also be discussing the methods to the madness, HIPAA, high trust and other frameworks. What is the secret source and recipe? How can we successfully implement a robust health data security program? And finally, insights, lessons learned and common pitfalls by an industry expert. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce you to our panel and we will hear, we'll be hearing from Brendan Revell, who is the head of IT for Capital Health um, for three years. Um, Capital Health is a national network of community-based diagnostic imaging clinics and specialist radiology services. They have over 63 um, clinics under multiple brands um, with over 800 staff across four states, and they deliver over 1.2 million diagnostic images studies every year. And Brandon has been involved in helping boost and their cybersecurity footprint by providing a large scale security uplift program to organization as head of IT. Brendan, would you like to say hi? Hey everyone, thanks for joining. Awesome. We will also be hearing for Adia, Adia, Aditya Upapa, who is Chief Cybersecurity Officer at Isha IT. Aditya has spent a decade in cybersecurity and has varied skills and experiences across pen testing, red team assessment, and also helping clients who has varied skills and experience, oh, sorry, who's been helping clients in cybersecurity compliance goals. He's also aiding around global and leading enterprise and SMB businesses. Aditya is also a certified high trust practitioner. Aditya, would you like to say a few words? Good afternoon, folks. Great to have all of you here today with us. Awesome. And we'll also be hearing from Alvin Rafferty, the Managing Director of ITSEC Australia. Alvin originally comes from an insurance and risk background where he spent over 13 years in insurance industry, helping clients migrate across many verticals such as fintech, insurance, manufacturing, health and government. Alvin has also had a passion for managing risk and had a very close interest to the emerging rise and threats that have been happening in the cybersecurity industry. Alvin, would you like to introduce ITSEC Australia? Hi everyone, thank you for joining. Uh, 
IT sector and cybersecurity MSP. We are originally from uh, Singapore and Asia Pacific. In 2017, we expanded our operations into Australia and we're now delivering our, uh, leveraging our services and delivering our services into the Australian market. And um, I would like to personally thank all of you for joining. Uh, and I really hope you get something out of this session uh, over the next uh, 50 minutes or so. Thank you, Alvin. So let's dive straight into it. Aditya, can you talk us through some current environment for health data and the breakdown of the elements? Sure. So I'd like to first start with the basics. Uh, what is health data? What are its elements, right? In Australia, you know, your health records are called My Health Record or MHR. In around the world, it's called EMR, EHR, PHI. They're all one and the same, but they essentially constitute more than your name and your insurance details. What your health data records constitute are your record numbers, your photographs, images, scans, treatment dates, summary of, of medical aid or treatment provided, unique characteristics like your fingerprints, codes, numbers, past records, et cetera. So there's a wealth of information in your MHR today. Uh, in Australia, MHR has been active for the last couple of years and it's grown over time, especially due to the era that we live in, which is due to COVID, telehealth has seen a massive boom, right? That said, MHR is being leveraged to another degree altogether. What I see is two factions of folks today. Either you have the adopters and you don't, and you have, you know, individuals who are yet to adopt MHR. You know, there's a lot of, lot of information that is provided about MHR and how can you secure it. But as an individual, you know, you can log into the myhealthrecord.gov.au to go see your record, you know, set up a pin, see what kind of information do you have, set up a pin to control access, et cetera. So all of those features are provided. So the Australian government has been working on strengthening it. But with that said, you know, there is a long way to go from both an adoption and a security standpoint. At this point, I'd like to get Brendan's inputs as to how did they figured out the health data challenge and what did he see at Capital? Uh, yeah, thanks, mate. Um, yeah, so as, as Davina mentioned, Capital Health, we're an ASX listed uh, company, you know, community focused diagnostic image provider, um, very dispersed. We've got 63 clinics uh, across Australia, um, you know, with multiple brands. So just to give everyone, you know, just a quick snapshot of what that means in terms of. Uh, I guess the the amount of healthcare data we hold, uh, most of which contains you know PII. Um, so we have around twenty thousand referrers, so you know GPs and specialists uh, in our systems, which you know that contains their unique provider number, uh, their address, uh, their name. Um, we hold roughly two point five million individual patient records. Uh, again, in our, in our primary radiology information system, you know, and that has Medicare number, um, full name, date of birth, uh, address. Um, and the next piece of data that, that we hold, um, you know, is, is we're sort of reaching now 10 million or we've just surpassed 10 million diagnostic images, so scans. Um, you know, that's, that's going from the average Joe uh, to AFL footballers, um, you know, well-known public figures uh, as well, you know, is in our, in our systems. Um, you know, I guess for us, the, the catalyst or, you know, what was kind of asked myself, what was the catalyst um, for us to start looking at doing a major security uplift? Um, you know, for us, it's really, and for everyone else probably on this call as well, it's, it's really around the fact that, you know, the protection of, of health information is critical to the success of our business. You know, we'd, we'd be um, <clears throat> trying, you know, we're trying obviously to keep ourselves off the front page of the newspaper. Um, you know, and, and there's also other major factors, of course, that um, we briefly touched on already, that cyber crime is now the number one economic crime in Australia. So that was a big factor for us. Uh, also, you know, health services sector is the most targeted sector now for cyber crime. Again, very scary for, for us in healthcare. Uh, and of course, you know, back in 2018, the introduction of um, the Australian Privacy Amendment 
notifiable data is data breach act. Um, so yeah, there's sort of a bit of a few things that were the catalyst for us. Great. So Brendan mentioned a very important point. Health information security is critical for the organization. At this point, I would like to talk about how health data today is mobile, right? And how it moves between various entities. Divina? Yes. Um, there we go. All right. So, so why did I say health data today is mobile? It's no more just restricted in a hospital or a, gen, a general physician's office. Today, there are multiple entities that come into picture for providing health secure, you know, health, health, any health and uh, you know, health tech, et cetera, right? So you of course have the patient and the various entities that kind of bind around this particular individual would be the labs, you know, you'd have the pharmacies, you'll have the insurance brands, you'd have the care managers, the government, of course, co the community health services, all of your payers, imaging centers, et cetera. So it's a multitude of folks who do get access to, you know, an individual's health data. And because this is mobile, because this is no more restricted in say an hospital, it's gone beyond, you know, on-prem systems as well. It's on the cloud, it's on, you know, people's phones, it's between various vendors and service providers. That's exactly why it is so very important to, 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 to look at, you know, where is the information traveling and you as an organization, what amount of health data are you taking into your organization and what kind of safeguards do you have in place, right? I'm going to bring Brendan back again to just get a quick, uh, you know, a point or two about, you know, how is that them as a health tech really combated this and thought through how can, you know, how, how did they take in health data and how did they look to roll out health data security? Brendan, you're muted. Sorry, mate. Um, yeah, you know, I, I guess for us, what we did, we, we took a, um, a strategic approach um, to sort of, um, you know, three, I guess we could say we we tackled uh, we tackled this based around three primary steps. Um, you know what we looked at um, from a strategic improvement perspective was uh, to integrate. You know we wanted to make sure that we integrated security into the fabric of the organisation. Um, you know pr to prepare as well. So you know to plan for what's expected uh, and also pr to prepare for what is unexpected. Um, you know, so that was sort of some key strategic steps. And the third one was, um, you know, continuous improvement. So to continuously uh, be honest and measure, um, you know, where we're at. Um, so, you know, rather than just sort of put something in, put some sexy tools in and, and say that's it, uh, is to continuously measure. Um, no. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. All right. So going forward. At this point, I'd like to show you some statistics, just like every, every business out there. Uh, it's very, very important to understand what kind of statistics are available, you know, how, what is the real threat out there. So I'd like to talk about how health data is becoming the new oil. Now, of course, that's, that's a term that is well used about how data is the new oil, but not all personal data is equal because your health data has critical information about your past treatments, about your current conditions, your medicines, et cetera, right? Which can be, you know, abused for various, in, in, in various forms. That makes it more critical than other personal data. To give you an example, the average sale price per record on the dark web is about $429. Compare that to a, a credit card information, which retails at about between five and $10, right? So there's a big difference. That said, you can always get a new credit card. You can't get a new health record. Once it's out there, it's out there, right? So I'd quickly talk to you about how, you know, the breaches in the last couple of years have really impacted the health industry. What was seen was the top threat patterns have predominantly been human error, privilege misuse, and hacking. Now, when you see human error and privilege misuse, it's a very, very important that point that I want to bring up here is the health industry is the only industry where the internal threat supersedes external threat. And that's so very important 
for service providers and health techs and all the other technology service providers to really think about, right? Because when you take in information, when you take in health data, you know, it's your responsibility to secure this, right? The, the motives in most cases, of course, is financial, 83%, right? And what was the data that was compromised? About 72% was health records. Like Brendan mentioned, you know, there are a bunch of folks uh, from the AFL, you have a couple of celebrities, you know, it could be anything. It could be information that's stolen, uh, you know, which is sold, which is used for blackmail, et cetera. So there, there could be a multitude of reasons, you know, or, or ways that, you know, one could really exploit these compromised medical records. Now, talking about some statistics, I don't have statistics uh, about Australia uh, for the simple reason that, you know, US was the biggest adopter of digital health and, and records. And, uh, you know, and, and then came the other countries. And what we're seeing in, in, in America is going to follow suit in the other countries. So between 2009 and 2018, there were 2,500 breaches just in the US health care sector out of which 6 million records were compromised, right? Just in the period of January to May, just in six months, there were 6 million records that were compromised. That's a massive number, right? And about 77% of all data breaches in 2019 were caused by healthcare providers. Now, these are massive staggering numbers. These are numbers that are going to relay into the, the other countries that are fast adopting digital health records. At this point, I'd like to call upon my mate to talk about Australia and how does it really impact Australia. Thanks, Aditya. So the last 24 months has been, obviously, we've seen a major shift from uh, data moving uh, to be online. So with more data moving online, obviously, the rise of attacks uh, in healthcare data has increased significantly. So we did some, um, we pulled out some studies, we found, uncovered that one in five organisations in Australia had suffered a health data breach in the last 12 months. And of those one in five, one in three were due to human error, which was quite staggering. So obviously we're aware now of the notify, notifiable data breach scheme that's come into place by the Office of the Australian Information Commissioner, which requires you to uh, notify your customers and the government of a data breach. So last year, 965 people came forward um, and advised the OAIC of a data breach. 65% of those 965 were genuine malicious attacks and malicious activity, uh, and 35% were human error. And when I talk about human error, I'm talking about not someone sending a file by accident. I'm talking about the rise in social engineering, um, spear phishing, phishing, and business email compromise and impersonating someone to in order to transfer funds or uh, sensitive information from one person to the other. So that's been a major rise. Um, and obviously with the advent and the emergence of my health record moving to online, you know, significant amounts of health data now have moved to that online, um, you know, and you know, essentially creating more risk. Um, and then the innovation boom of rising health tech, you know, we all want to go to a dentist now and get an x-ray done and we want it sent to an orthodontist almost immediately. That gets shipped or emailed uh, to an orthodontist, you know, almost instantly. But, um, uh, and that's creating more replication, more volume um, of data uh, online. Um, and we always think about, you know, how many people have access to, to this data and no longer does your data go from point A to its endpoint and point B, it actually goes, your endpoint is point D or E, and it actually goes from A, B, C, D, E, F, uh, before it finally gets to its endpoint. So you think about how many people are touching that, how many people are exposed and have no proper training and understanding on how to manage health data, uh, and how many times that gets replicated and put out there and, and duplicate copies made. So it is a significant um, um, thing that we are seeing in the, uh, um, in, in Australia today. Uh, Davina. Uh, you're on mute, Davina. Um, thanks, thanks, Davina. Um, so when we think about health data, I think most people just think it's hospitals and it doesn't it doesn't relate to them. So what we want 
our customers to understand is that a lot of us are touching health data without even knowing it or um, actually um, know, know that they touch it and don't know actually how to properly secure it and what they should be doing about it. So we think about hospitals, but it's actually a lot of health tech organisations and software providers, healthcare institutions. Managed service providers are a perfect example. You know, they're getting visibility into your network. They want to understand, you know, they monitoring your logs, they're monitoring your emails, and they've, they're all getting access to your health data. Um, so these are some of the organizations, hosting providers, cloud providers, lift and shift uh, companies are also getting access to your, or need to have access to your data in order to, perf to properly perform the engagement from start to finish. And then as simple as your support centers and your IT service providers, they are also uh, having access to your data. So. These, all these companies need to be mindful that they're touching health data and they need to be mindful and, and thinking about how they're gonna secure that because you know, that is, it's popular, it's the new oil, it's sensitive data that everyone wants their hands on. So they need to start taking some action and taking notice about uh, managing patients' data and health data. Um, thanks, Davina. Thanks, Alvin. So now I just um, did a poll actually. And um, so thank you, Alvin, again, for giving us hi and highlighting the particular companies. Um, I would like to move forward and I did do the poll and um, I'm gonna bring Brandon into this to talk about some problem statements in um, health data security. Um, Brandon, would you like to start? And I'll just uh, wait for a few more to um, do the poll. You good, Brendan? All right, we're good. Yep. Just one second here. Just gotta exit the full screen mode. Um, yeah, so what we've done here is, you know, just at a high level, um, you know, we thought, we thought we'd list out some, um, some problem statements uh, that, you know, that I've faced and no doubt everyone on the calls faced in the, in the uh, healthcare industry. Um, you know, we talk about unique threat landscape, you know, we're dealing with internal and external threats. Um, we're dealing with dispersed, uh, dispersed networks, human error, curious insiders, you know, lack of physical controls uh, within our clinics. Um, you know, lack of security awareness is a major gap, um, you know, from staff. Um, and also, you know, the introduction of, of telehealth recently has added a layer of complexity. Um, securing, securing legacy systems, um, yeah, again, um, you know, legacy systems do take up a big chunk of our IT environment, um, you know, currently for us and, and also for you guys as well, no doubt. Yeah, and it's becoming more difficult, I guess, to keep them secure um, without causing downtime. Um, you know, for example, in my domain, please don't laugh at me and uh, I'm sure it's going to be a bit of an eek moment, but, you know, we still do have some old uh, legacy modality machines like CTs and MRIs that connect to a Windows 7 box. Um, you know, so we got to <clears throat> sort of think outside the box to, to secure that, um, that workstation. Um, nothing new here uh, for us IT folk. Budget's always, always hard to get, you know, especially, you know, I found in initially in cybersecurity was hard. Um, a lot of uh, exec suites sort of, you know, see it as just sexy, shiny new toys and, and that's all IT folk want. Um, you know, so, because often, a, you know, a major security uplift does require um, upgrading infrastructure, upskilling staff, uh, and of course, you know, new software as well. So, you know, a lot of spend um, for tools and, and people. Um, you know, so yeah, it's it's, that is particular a major challenge, especially in these times as well during COVID under strict budgets. Um, and also, you know, the commonality of uh, the business always trying to reduce the IT cost to serve. Um, so, you know, big challenge there. Um, data and securing in all formats. Um, you know, it's important to understand where all our data lies. Um, you know, so that, that's, that is a difficult challenge to figure out where everything is hosted on-prem through partners, providers, um, securing data in transmission. Um, you know, for example, for, for, uh, for Capital, we, you know, we send diagnostic reports to GPs, you know, about 20,000 GPs. 
that sent via a secure channel, but you know, we'll often get requests from from doctors to say, you know, can't you just email me, you know, that report. Um, so yeah, we also partner with a um, AI company in in the US. Um, so of course, sending data over there, um, you know, transmitted over the wire needs to be um, de-identified. Um, you know, so we got to we got to think of of data sovereignty as well. Um, scaling, you know, poor hygiene, or poor security hygiene. Sorry, um, you know, rap, being able to rapidly scale your your IT infrastructure to be able to adopt, um, you know, new technologies, cloud or mobile, you know, um, and challenges there is is sort of the pressure to get things going. Uh, without having, you know, security practices within your, you know, as I mentioned before, within your your hygiene, your IT hygiene. Uh, and this one just seems to stick around no matter how advanced we get as, as businesses or, you know, IT teams, patching is always a problem. Um, so, you know, and in particular, patching uh, old medical devices, um, you know, because um, as we all know, you know, ransomware still is, um, you know, one of the most common attack vectors. Um, yeah. Great. Excellent. Thank you, Brendan. Um, I've just got the results from the poll and most of you said all of the above, but um, we actually have a lot in securing legacy systems has been a 30%. Most of you guys said that that's one of the main issues. Um, and also a little bit more on scaling and poor security hygiene as well. So um, generally all of the topics um, with more than half that you guys said that you're having these problems. Aditya, did you want to touch on any of these or shall I move on? No, absolutely. I, I think everybody's got a spot on. I think all of the above is a, is a big pain point. Next followed by a legacy systems. I know the, the issues associated to it, but that said, uh, yeah, you know, uh, the, poll, the poll stands correct. So Definitely. over to you, Alvin. Yeah, same, I agree. Um, legacy systems, I think that um, is the biggest bugbear, but um, um, yeah. yeah, totally agree, guys. And thank you, Brendan, for being so transparent and telling us um, what's in your environment. It really puts everything into perspective and we can resonate with you on this um, as a poll shows. I'm going to move on to um, the 101 no on um, Australian Global. So Alvin, could you take it off for us? Yeah, sure. Thanks, guys. So just a little bit about the security laws and regulations in Australia. We have the Notifiable Data Breach Act, which was introduced in February 20, uh, 2018. Now, um, the one good thing that the government are doing is rather than penalising you for a data breach, they're actually working closely with you because they want us in Australia to get on top of um, cybercrime. And unfortunately, at the moment, we're not we don't seem to be winning the battle. Uh, we're heavily outnumbered. So, you know, it's a great initiative from the government that they're trying to help us and work with us um, rather than slap us with a fine. So that's a fantastic initiative by them. Got the Privacy Act of 1988, uh, which is a legislation of how we need to manage, secure and handle sensitive information, which is a fantastic legislation that was put into place. And then in more recent times, My Health Records and my health, the My Health Records rule. Now, they are great rules to have and great legislations to have, but we need to have something more, uh, a framework, so to speak, or a benchmark or a set of uh, guidelines that we need to follow in order to manage um, and uh, health, health data. So fortunately, fortunately, there's a global standard um, and that global standard is, is heavily adopted around the world and it is also being adopted in Australia at the moment. Um, and that's called HIPAA, uh, the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act of 1996, which is how we need to uh, handle Australia uh, health data. And for those who want to go that step further, um, the high trust certification. And as we all know, anything with a certification instills more confidence within our customers, okay? If we are ISO compliant, customers know that you've gone through that rigorous process and you've done all the checks and balances to make sure you're, that you're compliant and high trust is recognized in that same format in relation to healthcare data. So with that, um, sub a subject matter expert is a ditcher who is just going to give you some more insight around high trust and, and HIPAA um, and how this is something Australian organizations can start to look to adopt. Thank you, Alvin. 
So, like Alvin mentioned, there's been a rise in organizations in Australia trying to comply with HIPAA. And we've also started to see a staggering number of requests coming in for high trust. High trust being a certifiable standard for health data security makes it a gold standard that all health organizations are trying to attain. But that said, there are a ton of benefits just in a certificate uh, to HIPAA or high trust in this case is the fact that you get a structured program. You get a structured program of how can you, you know, what kind of requirements do you need? What kind of control should you have? How do you go about this entire process of rolling out health data security? And that's something that you get from HIPAA high trust vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, regulations and laws. That said, what it allows you to then do is enables you to have data security across the organization, look at your CIAs, look at you know, how is data stored in transition, and in, 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 how's, it, how's, it, uh, you know, how's it encrypted in trans transmission, how's it stored, et cetera. And this indirectly and directly helps reduce the chances of a security breach, right? Uh, also, as part of this entire process, you go through, through a systematic identification of what are your most critical hosts, what are your workflows? Where are all your risks that exist? What are your inherent risks? What are your vendor risks? What are your vulnerabilities, et cetera? So this basically helps identify all of that, right? And lastly, before, you know, I mean, it's often said that humans are the weakest link in security. I mean, that said, you know, this really helps for security and employees because this creation of the mere policies and procedures associated with these standards and rolling them out across the organization, having various, you know, various risk owners, asset owners accept these policy procedures makes them directly, uh, you know, directly liable for security, right? And lastly, brand reputation. This is a certification program. This enables you to showcase a superior security posture to your clients, right? That said, I'd like to quickly talk to you about HIPAA and what can you do to, you know, meet HIPAA requirements. Now. HIPAA's primary goal as a law, law in, in 1996 was to help keep health insurance, uh, you know, make it super easy, protect the confidentiality and the security of health, uh, healthcare information, and, uh, and, 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 you know, to streamline the entire digital health record schema, right? That said, there is no health, there's no third party certification associated with HIPAA, right? Now, I've listed out a couple of points just for the audience to understand, you know, what kind of steps do you, can, you, can you undertake in your organization to meet HIPAA requirements? And these are very, very simple steps. You know, first is to draft a security and privacy policy, name a security and privacy officer, have someone responsible for it. Next is understand and identify the types of health data you have and where is it all located? Is it on a mobile phone? Is it on, you know, people's endpoints? Is it in your scanning, uh, you know, scanning uh, devices? Is it on the cloud? Then do a risk assessment to understand what is your inherent risk? What is your vendor risk? What are your risks associated to you as an organization? Then go ahead and conduct technical analysis in the form of a penetration test, a vulnerability scan, write up your policy procedures, because those are very, very important for adherence, right? Because it really helps build uh, a, sense of, uh, a sense of security among your staff, have security awareness, and uh, you know, solidify, solidify all of your contracts with your vendors. This essentially is the, the, the recipe for success and for meeting HIPAA's requirements, right? And lastly, you know, establish a protocol for, for breaches. It's similar, similar to Australia. And uh, I think lastly, it's very, very important to ensure that the policies and procedures are followed and not just these really nice pre documents that are lying in SharePoint, right? So these are a couple of ways how you can, how you can meet HIPAA's requirements. Now that said, I'd like to quickly talk to you about what is the difference between HIPAA and high trust? This is a very, very common question. Like I mentioned earlier, high trust is, a, is an assessment and you can achieve a certification. Uh, whereas HIPAA is not, you know, is, is, there's no third party certification. You know, the updates are based on the Congress and it's not quite often. And there's no third party independent contractor who can audit you against. Lastly, is not very prescriptive. It's a guideline, but what high trust as a certification is, is more prescriptive. It is more robust from a security requirement standpoint. It not only requires you to write up your policy procedures, ensure adherence, but also requires you to implement those controls 
and have management and measurement for those particular controls. It's updated annually. So it ensures that the latest threats are factored. And lastly, it's a recognized gold standard for showcasing security amongst all healthcare organizations or any organization coming to, you know, coming in contact with health data. At this point, I'd like to quickly show you a, a roadmap. I'm not going to talk about it too much because um, I like to talk about it in general. Um, I think when you when you think about walking down the walking down the route of health data security, where do you start? You know, you have to first understand what does your organization do, right? How do you take in health data? Is there a way that you could reduce your scope? Is there a way that you could you know, you, you could translate the risk in a different way. Is, is it possible for you to, uh, to, to shift some of that risk? Is it possible to leverage service providers to reduce some of that risk? And then really start understanding what are your most critical assets? You know, why are they critical? Define a target date, then start working with your organization uh, internally to select, you know, your implementation strategy and themes, select your, you know, your, your security officer, you know, start writing up uh, you know, doing a quick analysis or a gap assessment against the standard to understand how close or far you are from the standard and then start really defining your controls. You know, you might have gaps that is on security monitoring. So you identify say three vendors and you go ahead and you define that as a control. The same thing might be a control could be as simple as having a patch management system in place, right? So you have SLAs that are defined. So those are all controls and you kind of formulate that, you write it up, you have the necessary folks responsible, accountable for it. And then you start mapping out your existing controls also. So once all of this is done, you've really understood, you know, what kind of gaps you had, what kind of controls have you implemented and what kind of existing controls do you have, right? Once that is done, you know, you quickly move ahead to the assessment phase. At this point, um, um, you know, I'd like to talk about how it's very, very important to update your policy procedures, ensure it really uh, resonates well with the standard. Uh, you know, once your selection of controls, like I mentioned earlier is done, you know, go ahead and implement them, set up some measurement, uh, measurement mechanisms, and then go ahead, conduct a final assessment to understand whether you're actually meeting that particular requirement or not, and uh, train your folks and, and, and that's it. I mean, this is typically how an organization can meet health data security, right? That said, it's not very different fra from meeting the requirements of any, any general security certification or standard, but this is special emphasis given on health data and health data being mobile. It's very, very important to understand where all does your health data you know, flow, right? At this point, um, I'd like to call upon uh, Brendan to give us some information about uh, you know, some of his experience, what did he see as a, as a health data security implementer? Yeah, cool. Thanks, mate. Um, yeah, look, what we did, uh, you know, we've just listed some, some common uh, pitfalls there, or pitfalls that I face. Um, but, you know, we started off by defining a goal. Um, and, you know, what, what that goal was defined as was basically, you know, to bridge the gap between speed of attack and speed of defense to maintain confidentiality, integrity, uh, and availability of data and business operations. Um, so then what we decided, all right, we've, we've defined a goal, let's, let's set out to achieve it. Uh, and in trying to achieve that, you know, here's a bunch of, of pitfalls that, you know, that we come across. Um, you know, disconnect between management or senior management uh, and IT, you know, the executive suite not understanding cybersecurity, you know, a common maturity level is, is probably at the point of, you know, don't you just need a, an antivirus, you know, and as we all know on the call, uh, we don't even use a tool antivirus anymore, you know, it's advanced endpoint protection. Um, you know, so it's really about getting them on the journey. Um, I actually sent a, um, a, a book, uh, a book on, you know, on, you know cybersecurity for dummies uh, to the board, um, board members before I, I, um, gave a presentation to get the, the funding. Um, stretch resources, uh, you know, something which, you know, I'm, I'm open to say I failed at was, you know, I actually got the program of work approved. Uh, and then it was like, beauty, let's, uh, let's start rocking and rolling. 
Uh, but then I kind of had a bit of a an oh shit moment and realized um, how we actually, with our resources that we have currently, how we're going to manage all these new products. Um, you know, and then it's sort of, well, I can't, if we have a breach, I, I can't blame the lack of funding anymore. I can only blame myself for not actually putting in the right resources, you know, to, to support it. Um, you know, and experts to help you, uh, help you get through it. You know, I think this is, is highly important, you know, utilize experts to help you navigate, you know, through this crazy journey of, of what is the health security, uh, um, sector. Um, you know, for me, you know, I want to give a, a shout out to the IT sec team, you know, and their partners for helping me navigate through this, this crazy world, um, of, of cybersecurity, yeah, Alvin, that's a bit of an unpaid um, plug. Uh, I also saw a familiar face on the attendee list, you know, RJ from Proofpoint, you know, just another example of a strong security brand who have, who have helped me on the journey. So, you know, we, I certainly don't know it all, um, far from it, you know. So, you know, definitely recommend utilising experts in the field and, and, and well-known strong um, uh, businesses um, that specialise in this sector. Um, you know, to after we defined a, a goal, you know, I, I'd reckon after you define a goal um, of what you want about that of your security uplift, you know, I'd recommend just three simple steps: um, assess your your current security posture, create a strategic improvement plan, uh, and then oper operationalize it. Um, and that's where I mentioned before. You know, from that, we then came up with a strategic approach. The cybersecurity, you know, integrate, prepare, uh, and, and then measure. Um, yeah, that's it, guys. Hey, Brandon. So that said, I'd like to quickly talk to you about a, a health tech, and uh, very similar, but a health tech which basically grappled with the same issues and how is it that they were able to combat it. So we, we, you know, IDSec came across a particular health tech. They needed help. They were SaaS provider. They had a deadline to meet HIPAA and high trust requirements. It was a very, very short deadline. So they essentially leveraged experts uh, to help them understand uh, and, and, and how, you know, re really understand what are realistic time goals for them to hit uh, and how long they would take to meet HIPAA high trust requirements. Now that said, there were a couple of challenges. You know, this was an organization that was out of a WeWork. They had a couple of million dollars in funding, you know, but they were absolutely unaware of the health data. They, were, they had rapidly scaled IT and infrastructure because they had grown quickly. They'd taken in a lot of funding. They, didn't understand, they had very, very poor security maturity and they had no in-house security expertise. At this point, you know, because they started growing as a brand, they were being pushed sh to showcase security maturity to their clients and partners. And that's when they started thinking about security. And that's when they, you know, they headed to the phone, you know, gave IDSec a call. They started, they wanted to understand how can, you know, IDSec really help them through this particular journey. So how it was, how it was formulated was, I think the first step for any, any framework is to understand the lay of the land. So they, they did a discovery. They understood what kind of information they have, what kind of data did they have, segregate all of this data, de-identify, identify only the health data and where it located. Next was do a high level understanding of how good or bad they were, or more like bad or worse they were at that particular given time to really understand the level of effort that's required. And so I really working with this particular organization for writing up their policy procedures to, to help them understand what kind of controls, what kind of tools and technologies they would require to have in place to meet these two, 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 two requirements, right? And this was also a part of, of, of doing all of these activities was also to conduct a risk assessment and a pen test, identify all of your risks and vulnerabilities, and then draft up a roadmap for improvement, right? So once that's done, the organization set forth on this journey, this very, very short journey to implement, you know, using this particular roadmap where they had all of these tools and all of these technologies, you know, called out once that was done, you know, the, the organization, the consulting organization, IDSEC, came in, did a quick pre-audit, and that's okayed the entire effort. After which said point, this particular health, day, health tech went ahead for a high trust certification and successfully got certified within a record amount of time, right? And this allowed them to, to showcase 
a greater security posture to their end clients and, and partners. So, so that said, you know, this, this is in a very, very, in a nutshell, you know, an explanation of how did an organization successfully implement health data security. Now, this is of course a great story, but, but uh, and, and, you know, Brendan called out, you know, a couple of pitfalls, but we'd like to quickly talk to you about, and Alvin wants to talk to you about, you know, what are the things that an organization can really start implementing from tomorrow, right? So over to you, Alvin. Thank you. So I guess the first thing I would love everyone to understand on this call is start with the assumption that you are going to get hit by a cybersecurity attack at some point. Okay, because it is now not a matter of if, but when. And when it happens, you know, you, you will ask yourself the question, did you do everything you could to make sure you had a strong and robust environment? So start with that. If you start with that assumption, your mindset will be different on how you approach cybersecurity. Um, but there are a couple of things you can do, some that have little or no investment uh, that you can even start as early as tomorrow. The first thing you can do is just go into your organization and have a look at access and privilege and see who has elevated access within the organization. So, I mean, quite often, a lot of us have full administrational privileges and that's a, a, a significant threat to the organization. And by reducing elevated privilege within the organization, you immediately start to reduce and mitigate the internal threat surrounding the organization. So that's something you can do tomorrow, would cost you nothing. Um, you know, essentially you could sit with your IT team and start to review the administration and privilege uh, within the organization. Consider two-factor and MFA um, um, authentication for your environment, something really important to do as well. You can start by doing the basics tomorrow as well. You know, as we talked about patching, review your physical security. You know, can, can someone come and walk straight in with a USB stick and stick that into a machine and, you know, a copy data off immediately without being noticed? That's something you need to review. Review your passwords. We need to be better than password and welcome one as passwords now. You know, we've got to start adopting proper password management. Secure your mobile devices. Um, you know, our mobile devices now are walking computers. We've got access to OneDrive and Dropbox and, you know, effectively all of the information is stored uh, on, these, on these devices through Dropbox and OneDrive and people can immediately get access to it almost instantly. And obviously conduct regular health checks, uh, audits and do pen testing. I can't stress that enough. You know, if you haven't taken much of an approach um, get some visibility into your uh, environment first because um, I'd rather know what I have and what my problems are than not know at all. And even if you don't have budget, it's still best to just get a risk assessment and understand where the inherent problems lie so you can actually take that to management and say, well, I at least know what the challenges are. Whether or not you have budget to fulfil that straight away is another question, but at least you can start to get that visibility and address it. Um, I can't stress this enough. The biggest discussion point between me and my customers for 2018 and 2019 was security awareness. Um, I will tell you that attackers now have moved away from infrastructure. They now focus on people and social engineering is one of the biggest things that we are seeing. And, uh, and we need to start investing into our people and giving them the education and, to, and arming them with how to fight cybercrime. So, um, you know, a, a leading uh, endpoint uh, vendor released a, um, a report. They surveyed, or well, sorry, they did a research on 160 uh, countries. Australia ranked 12th in ransomware attacks, of most hit by ransomware attacks. But what was more concerning and what was more alarming was we ranked third in cost to remediate. So whether that be cost of we, we charge more or we work harder or we work longer, whatever it was, the cost of media, we were third in over 160 countries. So that's quite concerning and quite alarming. And a lot of that stuff is due to giving your, uh, your, um, your employees that education. Now, if you are going to consider a, a, an awareness, security awareness training program, there's a lot of options out there. There's a lot of tools that you can actually obtain on the internet at no cost. But the one thing, I will tell you, and one thing I will suggest is for the most effective type of security awareness training, you want something that reinforces 
and has a continuous methodology model. So not doing one YouTube video or two videos a year and giving them a, um, a video to watch. It has to be a constant reinforcement tool or a service that does regular phishing simulation attacks uh, and really reinforces that training on a regular basis. So that's my advice to you around, uh, you know, considering a security awareness training program. Back up and encrypt, uh, you know, um, I, I can't say there's enough. We should all be doing it. If you're not doing it, have a good pro backup and encryption program um, and backup to an offsite location. And if you can't do that, consider potentially an, a managed service provider. And last but not least, you know, have a goal, have a benchmark, have a set of standards that you want to um, ad adhere to. Um, you know, if you're following, if you're following an an objective and a goal uh, and a benchmark that gives you something to work for and work against to uh, work to and HIPAA and high trust if you are in the health data industry uh, to a uh, global standards that are being adopted right now as we speak uh, and it's Australia already started to take notice of this and Australian companies are already starting to implement this IT sec we're trying to create more awareness of this and um, it's something that, you know, if you're in health, in this health industry, I'd urge you to consider as well. Awesome. Thank you, Alvin. So many very insightful takeaways. Um, I'd like to thank all our speakers for a very informative session and for addressing some very important ways of building a robust health data security program. Um, and also for touching some frameworks that we could mediate and strength, strengthen our security posture. Um, I'd also like to just um, take uh, this moment to do some Q&A and also I'd like to talk about the quick poll that we did um, just before us. What are the great uh, biggest pitfall factors while imp implementing health data security? And I'd just like to say we have about 33% um, saying that picking the incorrect scope and lack of uh, stakeholder buy-in, that was probably the highest one. And um, a lot of them were all of the above as well, but the highest was definitely that one I just mentioned. Yeah, so do we have any questions? Please pop them in. Uh, okay. So I see one question, Davina, yeah. about, um, you know, suggest, we need to better understand what are we securing? Uh, how important is that to have a sound data governance process and practice in mm -hmm. place to ensure that they, we understand what we are securing, who's responsible and how much we should be securing it, right? I think that's a great question about really hitting the hammer on the nail. Um, I can take a first stab at it. Um, so what are you essentially securing? You're essentially securing your health data. One of the important points that I spoke about early on was to identify your scope. You, of course, might have terabytes of data or petabytes of data in some cases, right? It's very, very important for you to de-identify your health data and treat it with utmost care, right? And, and, and that should be your crown jewel along with other critical assets that you're trying to secure you know, very, very robustly. Now, it is very, very important to have data government processes and practices, right? If your team doesn't know how to react for a particular incident, if your team doesn't know that a critical patch has to be pushed out within eight hours, right? That's not gonna happen. It has to be in black and white. And these are things that have to be acknowledged and understood by your risk and asset owners. And why I emphasize on that term, I saw back in the day where you, would you say asset owners? That's now progress to risk owners. Today, these asset owners are actually your risk owners and they have the owners for ensuring that that particular risk doesn't get exploited, right? So it's very, very important that you have this governance structure, you have great robust policy procedures, you have your standard operating procedures of how to do what in what scenario. Right? Who's responsible? Another thing that's called out very well in these policy procedures about who's responsible for implementation. So that person has to be called out. You should have, ideally, you should have artifacts to showcase how can you even push a particular patch in case your, your Linux administrators on leave and there's a critical patch that's come on. Somebody needs to have 
the ability to do so on his behalf, even though they might be a more junior level resource, right? So it's very, very important to call out that responsibility and accountability and the accountability would always lie with IT or security from a department head standpoint. And how much should you be securing? There's no, there's no limit to how much you could secure, but just, but just ensure that you have these, you know, these policy procedures and your necessary controls and tools in place, and they're working as per they're supposed to. Your security monitoring should not just be a checkbox, right? It should actually be doing a 24 bar seven. Um, any, any, any thoughts, uh, Brendan, uh, that, that, that you would may have? I was just, uh, yeah, I can't add anything further to that. Um, I was just actually um, um, looking at the, the the question by uh, by RJ here, but um, yeah, to, to that question, I think, yeah, you answered it spot on. I, I can't add uh, anything to that one. The question that we've got next is, what are ways you are securing communication between your GPs, customers, suppliers, and partners? That's the first question. And the second question, how are you monitoring and trying to uh, migrate human error leading to data breaches? Yeah, so, you know, for our communication between um, uh, GPs uh, and, and us, uh, we use a secure protocol um, via, it's called HL7, uh, which is a report distribution method um, by a company called HealthLink. There are other companies that do it, but we use a company called HealthLink. Uh, for customers at this point in time, the only way they can get uh, access to their reports um, is either via their GP, um, so it's sort of out of our control. Um, however, we do get a lot of um, people asking if they can, if we can email their reports, which we certainly don't don't do. Um, but you know, in that instance, what we say is come into a clinic, show identification, and we can um, we can put it on a, a, a USB for you. Um, does sound a bit archaic, that method. Um, you know, we are looking at, uh, as technology evolves, we're looking at uh, patient portals uh, for our patients to get access to that data. Uh, second part, you know, how are we monitoring and trying to mitigate human error? Um, through a range of tools, um, you know, we, we have an AI tool actually in place over our environment, which looks for, um, or it identifies common patterns within our network um, for every user uh, and for just general network traffic. Uh, and then um, I guess highlights uncommon patterns. Um, so if, if I have X amount of emails per day uh, and I only go to my OneDrive or you know, a couple of um, network shares, um, that's common behavior. Um, whereas if all of a sudden I've got a, uh, an FTP connection from my workstation to um, to Russia, uh, then this system would identify that, um, you know, and alert, um, you know, so that could, um, you know, have, you know, potentially, you know, mitigate uh, data breaches, uh, and also, uh, yes, again, um, you know, through the the guys at ITSEC and and their partners, you know, we have uh, our, our network monitored. 24 by 7 by 365, um, you know, to look for um, potential data breaches. Excellent. Yep. Aditya, do we have um, a time for one more question or? Yeah, Alvin, if you could just squeeze in a quick response because you're the, you're the expert in Australia. <laughs> for the last uh, Sure. sure. What? Um, what I might do is I, I'm a stickler for time. Uh, I don't like to keep anyone uh, longer than what we intended. This question from the last person, I'd love to take that offline and respond back to you um, uh, personally. So I might just do that just only because we might just go well over time if we do that. So if you don't mind, I will uh, respond to you on that question um, straight after this. No problem, Alvin. Um, so thank you everyone for your time. We really appreciate you joining on our webinar and I really hope it was insightful and we really do look forward to seeing you at our next webinar. So please um, connect with us on LinkedIn and um, yeah, we would love to um, connect with you there. Thanks everyone. And please, uh, if you had Thanks. any other additional questions, please reach out to me on, on uh, email uh, and, or, or reach out to our team. Um, and I'd like to also, you know, once again, thank our panelists of Aditya, Davina and Brendan as well. Thank you so much, guys. No problems. See you guys. Thank you all. Thank you. Stay safe. Thank you for your time. Have a great day. Bye. Bye.